Chapter Nine of Savarin's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Tent. Savarin's Disappearance, Chapter Nine. The guest creates a sensation at the Royal Oak. Well, said Haskins, I didn't hear of you quite so far off as Nashville. It was when I was travelling in Kentucky buying horses last year. At Lexington I fell in with an English chap named Randall, who used to live in this neighbourhood. I hired him to buy horses for me. He was with me about three months, and if I could only have kept him sober, he would have been with me yet for he was about as keen a judge of a horse as ever I came across in my born days, and knew mighty well how to make a bargain. Well, we hadn't been together a week afore he began to tell me about a place where he used to live in Canada West, where he said a little money went a long way, and where good horses could be bought cheap. He wanted me to send him up here to buy for me, and I don't know, but I should have done it if I had found he was to be trusted. But he would drink like all creation when he had money. Old Bourbon was a thing he couldn't resist. He had an awful poor opinion of all the rest of our American institutions, and used to say they want to own no account as compared to what he used to have to home in England. But when it came to bourbon whisky, he was full-mouthed as Uncle Henry Clay himself. He allowed there weren't anything either in England or in Canada to touch it, and when he got four or five inches of it inside him, there was no kidding along with him, no how. There weren't anything on earth he wouldn't do to get a couple of inches more, and when he got them, he was the catavampituousest critter I ever did see. You couldn't place any more dependence on him than on a free nigger. Besides, he used to neglect his wife, and a man who neglects his wife and a man to trust with a couple of thousand dollars at a time. No, sir, real not much he ain't, but as I was saying, the way he used to harp on this place of lapperies was a caution. Whenever we used to get planted down in one of our crossroad taverns, he would turn up his nose till you could see clean down his throat into his stomach. The fact is, our country taverns ain't up too much, and sometimes I could hardly stand em myself. When we'd come in after a hardy day's ridin' and get sawed down to a feed of heavy shot cake and fat pork, then Randall would begin to blow about the grub up here at Lapier's. He used to tell about the hot suppers served up here to a parcel of farmers on Saturday nights till I most got sick o' hearing him. But I see your mugs are empty again, gentlemen. Landlord, please, to do your duty and score it up to yours truly. During this long harangue, the assembled guests alternately scanned the speaker and each other with inquiring but vacant countenances. They were puzzling themselves to think who this Randall could be, as no man of that name had ever been known in that community. When Mr. Haskins paused in his discourse and gave his order for replenishment, Farmer Donaldson was about to remonstrate against this second treat at the expense of a stranger, and to propose that he himself should stand sponsor for the incoming refreshments. But before he could get out a word, the landlord suddenly sprang from his seat with a white, agitated face. "'Tell me,' he said, addressing the stranger, "'what like is this Santel? Please describe his features.' "'Well,' drawled the person addressed after a short pause, "'there ain't much to describe about him. He is a tallish feller, fully four inches taller than I be. He is broad and stout, a big man generally. Weighs, I should say, not much under a hundred and ninety. Rather light-complected, and has a long cut in his face that shows awful white when he gets his back up. Thunder! He pretty nearly scared me with that gash one night when he was drunk. It seemed to open and shut like a clamshell, 
and made him look like a voodoo priest. You would think the blood was gone to spurt out by the yard. By this time, every pair of eyes in the room was staring into the speaker's face with an expression of bewildered astonishment. Not a man there but recognized the description as a vivid, if somewhat exaggerated portraiture of the long-lost Reginald Bouchier Severin. The stranger from Tennessee readily perceived that he had produced a genuine sensation. He gazed from one to another for a full minute without speaking. Then he gave vent to his surcharged feelings by the exclamation, For the land's sake! An air of speechless bewilderment still pervaded the entire group. They sat silent as statues, without motion and almost without breath. Lapierre was the first to recover himself. By a significant gesture, he imposed continued silence upon the company and began to ask questions. He succeeded in eliciting some further pertinent information. Haskins was unable to say when Randall had acquired a familiarity with the ways and doings of the people residing in the vicinity of the Royal Oak, but it must have been some time ago, as he had lived in the States long enough to have become acquainted with various localities there. As to when and why he had left Canada, the stranger was also totally ignorant. He knew, however, that Randall was living in the city of New York about three months ago. As he had seen him there, and had visited him at his lodgings on Amity Street in May, when he, Haskins, had attended as a delegate to a sporting convention. At that time, Randall had been employed in some capacity in Hitchcock's sales table, and made a few dollars now and again by breeding dogs. He lived a needy hand-to-mouth existence, and his poor wife had a hard time of it. His drinking habits prevented him from getting ahead in the world, and he never stayed long in one place. But the speaker had no doubt that he might still be heard of at Hitchcock's by anybody who wanted to hunt him up. But, added Mr. Haskins, I hope I haven't got him into trouble by coming here tonight. Has he done anything? Anything criminal, I mean? After a moment's deliberation, Lapierre told the whole story. There was no doubt in the mind of any member of the company that Randall and Savarine were parts of one stupendous whole. The one important question for consideration was what use ought to be made of the facts thus strangely brought to light. By this time supper was announced, and the stranger's news, exciting as it was, did not prevent the guests from doing ample justice to it. Haskins was loud in his praises of the spread, as he termed it. Jack Randall, he remarked, could lie when he had a mind to, but he told the holy truth when he bragged you up as far as ahead of the Kentucky cooks. Yes, I don't mind if I do take another morsel of that fricassee. Dog me if it don't beat canvas backs. Before the meeting broke up, it was agreed on all hands that for the present it would be advisable for the guests to allow the morrow to pass before saying anything to their wives or anyone else about Mr. Haskins disclosures. It was further resolved that the gentlemen should accompany Lapierre to Millbrook after breakfast in the morning, and that Mrs. Savarin's father should be made acquainted with the known facts. It was just possible, after all, that Jack Randall might be Jack Randall and not Savareen, in which case it was desirable to save the lost man's wife from cruel agitation to no purpose. It would be for her father, after learning all that they knew, to communicate the facts to her or to withhold them, as might seem best to him. On this understanding, the company broke up on the stroke of midnight. I am by no means prepared to maintain that their pledges were in all cases kept, and that they each and every one went to sleep without taking their wives into confidence respecting the strange disclosures of the night. End of chapter 9 Recording by Red Abris July 2008